Friday, November 22nd, 1963. My generation's vocabulary changed that day. New words, new phrases were added. And now a half a century later, they're still there. Their roots born right here in downtown Dallas, Texas. Dealey Plaza, the Texas School Book Depository, the sixth floor window, the grassy knoll, the triple underpass. Adoring crowds had met President John Fitzgerald Kennedy in Texas that late fall day, a liberal and conservative country looking for re-election votes. His beautiful wife, she in the perfect pink outfit that would forever be remembered, not like this, but instead, just an hour later, splattered with her husband's blood. As for the young president, just 46, the first U.S. leader to be born in the 20th century, not even three years in office, he would never grow older than this image, forever frozen on this Dallas day. My name is Pierce Hall, and this is where I was standing on November 22nd, 1963. The car came very slowly, and then it made the turn right behind me. I was absolutely enthralled. The President and Mrs. Kennedy looked like a first couple ought to, and then as they turned, that first loud, explosive sound. And so it began, 72 hours that would change America. Something is wrong here, something is terribly wrong. There's numerous people running up the hill. I repeat, a shooting at the motorcade in the downtown area. I can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a secret service man, Spread Eagle, over the top of the car. I can see many, many motorcycles coming by now. The official body, as I can see it, pulling around toward the emergency room of Parkwood Hospital. The policeman says, no, you cannot come in here. You cannot come in here. And just now, we've received reports here at Parkland. The president was hit in the head. Just a moment. Just a moment. We have a bulletin coming in. It's official now. The president is dead. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. As their prime suspect, police seized 24-year-old Lee H. Oswald. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. This is Pete has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. Here comes the ambulance. Oswald will be removed now. Here comes Oswald. He's he is ashen and unconscious. I just couldn't believe it when I heard it. We were in school. All of a sudden, we were just told the president was dead. Down this avenue of sadness, they bring President John F. Kennedy, martyred hero, to lie in state under the great dome of the Capitol. I was 15 back then, and like so many others, I was glued to the television set all weekend. It was one of the seminal moments of my childhood, and ever since, I've wondered, what really happened, and why does it haunt us still? Okay, one of my favorite Kennedy stories. I'll Millions of people one. come to Dallas every year. Really, this trip was brought so that we could get to know Jackie, because we loved Jackie. We loved Tens kids. of thousands loved come for just Jackie. one reason. It's uh, part of our history. Kind of a sad moment in history, but but uh, need to see it. I mean, you can kind of stand here and feel like it, what it must have felt like, you know, to see, to, to think of what it was like that day. We're not makers of this history. We were keepers and are keepers of this history. They visit the Texas School Book Depository, where Lee Harvey Oswald worked where in the sixth floor window, he aimed his rifle and fired three shots at the 35th president of the United States. 
My name is Gene Boone and I'm the deputy sheriff that found the rifle that Oswald used in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. When I found the rifle, I, first thing I did was look at my watch and it was 1.22 p.m. And uh, I said, here's the rifle and there was no question in my mind, but what, uh, with what I had observed already uh, in the sniper's nest, that this was the rifle that was used in the assassination. The sixth floor is a museum now to Assassination Day. It's all here, everything you might want to see about what happened. Even the dishes that the president would have used if he'd made it to lunch on that day. But the star attraction is the sniper's nest. It's all sealed off now, but it's set up inside behind that glass exactly the way it was on November 22nd. The window, it's closed. It's one window they don't want to see open again. They did let us see the same view from the same window one floor up, and here's what strikes anyone who comes here for the first time. It was not a long shot. Less than a hundred yards, not a challenge for Oswald, who'd been a Marine sharpshooter, scoring 96% from twice the distance. For those who believe Oswald acted alone, it's the clincher. That's what the official government investigation, the Warren Commission, decided. And while conspiracies abound and Dealey Plaza is full of people who spout the possibilities, no one has officially concluded anything different. Even though a plaque on this very building still encourages us to doubt. And doubt they do. This way you might have noticed there's two X's in the street. And the first X up the street here is where President Kennedy was shot. I'm Marshall Evans. I've been studying the assassination for 45 years. I live here in Dallas. I knew a lot of the witnesses that have passed away, and I know some of the remaining witnesses still. It is imperative the American public know the details of what really happened on that X in the street. We lost our heart and soul in America. America changed. It's imperative that the American public wake up. There are lots of theories. It was Castro, the Mafia, the Soviets, the CIA, you name it. It's not a cut and dry case. The Warren Commission left too many unsaid things. We're pulling them out. Why not? You know, why not get the truth? There have been books and movies, hundreds of them. So many that few Americans, even to this day, believe the official record. Three shots, one gunman, that's it, that's all. I think conspiracy theories will always be with us because of denial, the refusal to accept that someone so inconsequential as a Lee Oswald could accomplish something so world-shaping as killing someone like President Kennedy. Well, folks, I want to welcome you to Big D Fun Tours. This is our JFK Trolley Tour, and my name is Scott. This sounded bizarre to me. Would people really climb on a decorated trolley to travel around Dallas to see where all the Assassination Day moments took place? Because when I'm taking you folks, it looks like 1963 still a lot of these places. Haven't changed in 50 years. You betcha. Folks, starting right here all the way down, 50,000 people. And every single window in downtown has a face looking out of it. Folks, presidents, they didn't come to Texas. The trolley stops everywhere in the story, all in under 90 minutes. Right here is where the shots ran. Folks, the President's motorcade picks up speed, rushes President Kennedy to Parkland Hospital. At Parkland, Kennedy's lifeless body, with his wife draped over it, was brought to a medical team that desperately tried to bring a dead president back to life. My name is Phyllis Hall. I was a nurse here at Parkland Hospital and happened to be in the emergency room on November 22nd, 1963. Uh, there was a lot of chaos going on outside Trauma One with the different agents, security agencies because each agency wanted to be the one to stay there with the president and Mrs. Kennedy. Where was Mrs. Kennedy? She stayed in the room the whole time and she stood 
stood for the cart and she had her hand on his left foot. And uh, the supervisor at one time came in and asked her if she wouldn't like to have a seat out in the hallway. And the only words I heard her say were, no, I'm staying with him. Unfortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the president when it happened. See this picture? If you've ever studied November 22nd, you've almost certainly seen it. Appears to be seconds after the shots were fired, a young couple on the ground shielding their kids. And I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him in the hopes that it wasn't a maniac around me. They're the Newmans. They still live in Dallas, in their 70s now, and they love to talk about that day. But get out your wallet if you want to hear their story. It's 500 bucks a pop. But here's a guy who remembers it all and doesn't charge a penny. My name is Hugh Ainsworth. November 22nd of 1963, I was a reporter for the Dallas Morning News. And when the president rolled by this corner, I was standing right there in that intersection. Hugh Ainsworth's assignment that day, watching the crowds near the book depository, when history suddenly unfolded right in front of him. We didn't know where they were coming from, who was shooting, how many there were, or anything. It was quite scary. He heard the shots, he chased the story, and he still does. What do you think it is that fascinates people still about what happened here 50 years ago? Well, really, what the whole conspiracy thing and how it arose, uh, you could see it happening. Nobody was ready for this kind of a thing to happen, this, this magnitude. And, and one of the reasons was the terrible pressure on Dallas particularly. Because we had this bunch of far right nuts here. They were mean. There wasn't a big, big amount of them, but the mood was not pretty here. Kennedy and his family had been the Camelot presidency. All seemed possible. They were young, and so many of us in the boomer generation were energized by the excitement around them. The race for space, the promise of the moon, the idea of the Peace Corps, traveling the world to help others, initiatives that crossed borders and infected millions. Even Ottawa fell for the charm. Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends. Those whom nature has so joined together, let no man put asunder. President. I can now retire from politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me. Such a sweet And all led by someone who didn't seem out of place standing next to movie stars, sports stars, world stars. There was a sense of adventure with him, a sense of moving forward and doing things that hadn't been done before. The moment, perhaps, the stare down of Khrushchev on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, he obviously uh, must have thought he could do it in secret and that the United States would accept it. But not everything was perfect. The Bay of Pigs had been a disaster. And as for Vietnam, Kennedy saw no problem with U.S. involvement. In my opinion for us to withdraw from that effort would mean a collapse not only of South Vietnam, but Southeast Asia. So we're going to stay there. But overall, it was a generation inspired. Our time, we thought, had come. And then suddenly, so suddenly, it seemed all gone. Hugh Ainsworth has become a historian of sorts, not only into the assassination, but into his city. How has Dallas changed in 50 years? It changed years? a lot. Changed almost immediately, it was forced to. Because the whole world could have dumped Dallas in a hole. You know, the city of Dallas really struggled after the JFK assassination. Corporate America turned their back on Dallas. Dallas got a nickname called the City of Hate. And so, my fellow Americans, and not what your country can do for you, and what you can do for your country. 
the greatest inauguration speech in American history. Now you know what it was like to be here in Dallas as these days unfolded here in November. Thank you guys so very much. So Dallas has changed and we've changed, but many of us are still haunted by what happened here 50 years ago. Why? I've got some thoughts on that when we come back. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. So a half a century on, why are so many of us still caught up with what happened here in Dallas at that X in the middle of the road? Well, I guess we all have our own reasons. Here are mine. I still wonder what would have happened if Oswald had missed, if Kennedy had lived. What would our world have been like then? Would Kennedy have been re-elected in 1964? Would he have allowed Vietnam to become the killer of 58,000 American kids in a war they couldn't win? A war that inspired a generation to rise up in protest, some of it violent, some of it peaceful, some of it artistic. All of it eventually successful, but where would that generational energy have been directed and what might have it accomplished if there had been no Vietnam? Would Martin Luther King have been assassinated? Would American cities have burned in protest? I run for the presidency because I want the Democratic Party and the United States of America to stand for hope. Get the gun! Get the gun! Would Bobby Kennedy have been assassinated? Stay away from the gun! There is nothing wrong with America, my friends, that a good election won't cure. Let's have one! Would Richard Nixon have been elected in 1968? Well, I'm not a crook. Would Watergate have happened? And then there's the other side of the equation. We want freedom now. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Could Kennedy ever have passed the civil rights bill like LBJ did? Could a Kennedy, Jack or Bobby, ever have made the opening to China that Nixon did? The list could go on, of course, limited only by one's imagination. To some, though, it's a silly game to play. Oswald didn't miss. Kennedy did die, and that's the end of the story. Maybe. But for me, I'll keep wondering. Thank you.